Thanks, Mike. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate what you do and uh, what ADI does for us. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to get a chance to speak and, and reach out and create some relationship out there. Um, I've only been with the company for a short time, but I've been in the industry for a long time. Folks that know me, I've been around for 30 plus years. Uh, I was with uh, GE Security and UTC Interlogix for about half of that time uh, doing the same thing, uh, building relationships with folks and helping them solve their problems, which is what we do at Security Partners. Um, you know, we're a wholesale central station monitoring company um, and we're building strategic partnerships out there so that we can help folks grow their businesses, solve the issues that they have with inefficiencies and help bring in new channels of revenue. And that's pretty much what we do every single day. Uh, in the process, we get to save some lives, which is fantastic, prevent some fires, uh, obviously uh, arrest some bad folks and help in that process, which is great. But uh, it's also great getting to build those relationships out there. In this day and age, it's a little bit difficult because we're having to do it this way virtually. So we really appreciate all of you that have jumped online and are participating, uh, getting a chance to, to hear Mr. Egan speak. Um, and that leads me into introducing him. Uh, uh, most folks in the industry know Pat Egan. Uh, he's the owner of uh, Security Partners. He's owned several sales installations and service businesses over the decades. Um, he is a pillar within our industry. Um, and the opportunity to hear him speak on prospecting is a great one. Uh, I've been through this several times. And as I said, I've been in the industry selling for 30 years. And I still get to pick up tidbits from this particular presentation. So, uh, Pat, uh, thank you for doing this. And again, he and I are happy to chat with any of you if you have interest in talking to us about security partners. But we're going to turn it over to him and let him give you a, a really nice presentation about how to grow your business and some of the things you can do from a sales aspect and prospecting that'll do that. Pat, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Kirk and uh, Mike. Thanks uh, for the folks from Honeywell and ADI uh, putting this together and giving us the opportunity to present. Um, so it's either good morning, uh, good midday, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. We know we've got uh, uh, plenty of folks uh, logged in, and I hope you uh, hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, if you uh, do not need uh, any new customers, you guys can go ahead and log off. You don't need to put this hour in. Um, but but if you need some new opportunities or want to goose up your sales force, um, we put a little presentation together. Uh, it's about 33 uh, uh, different slides of a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, it's all about prospecting. It's all about finding new business and the steps in, in, in this selling process that identifies who those customers you should go after and what kind of product you might want to sell them. Uh, so I've got to connect down and get my, there we go. So why am I here? Um, Last time Kirk called me a veteran, that just means that I'm old, and, and, and that's true. Um, I'm the CEO and president of Security Partners. We're a boutique wholesale monitoring company. We've got about 200,000 monitored sites, 700 plus dealers, and we have three interconnected monitoring centers. Uh, they're located in Las Vegas, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and San Antonio. Uh, come and visit us. Um, and we did have a dealer support uh, a group out of Anaheim, but they are not doing any monitoring there anymore. A lot of my comments are, are, are also going to come from the retail side. Uh, a little bit of history on security partners. In 1998, we started. We opened up our central station here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. In the fall of 13, we bought Response Center USA in San Antonio. And then in the winter, we acquired Mace Central Station, which was a combination of two central stations in Anaheim. In 2014, we acquired one time in Las Vegas, and we also acquired a building and renovated a, uh, a government uh, data center, and that is our Las Vegas central station. And we moved the technology from Anaheim to Las Vegas uh, when we opened up in the uh, spring of 2014. Uh, just last year, 
Um, we uh, acquired a building actually across the street from Select. It was a, uh, a, a steam boiler manufacturing building, and we did an adaptive reuse, uh, about a $5 million uh, renovation of a 20,000 square foot facility. And uh, that, uh, that houses uh, corporate headquarters for security partners and our Mid Atlantic Central Station. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my retail experience too. I own Select Security. Uh, most, some of you may not know, but we're a uh, regional uh, company. I've got 20 some offices and about 300 employees, 55,000 customers throughout the Mid Atlantic and Southeast. So a lot of my comments will come from uh, come from uh, 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 my experience as an installer, as a salesperson, as an operator. Uh, a little bit about the retail real fast. I own a company called Commonwealth Security, 10 locations, 200 employees, 25,000 subscribers, 750,000 of RMR. And I sold that out in 1997. Um, I established Select Security March 1st of 2003. Uh, based on 2018, uh, SDM 100, we were the sixth largest individually owned company. Um, uh, the subscriber the accounts a little off, and we're about 55,000 customers. We were named one of the fastest growing security integrators in 2019. Um, so, in any seminar, they tell you, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them. So, these are the five things that I'm going to focus on lead flow, prospecting, referrals lead generation, and, and what a sales plan might be. So we're going to go over them again. Lead flow, prospecting, which is different than getting referrals, referrals, lead generation, and what's your sales plan. Um, do you know your sales cycle? I hope that most of the people on here are sales people or sales managers, customer service reps, but do you know your sales cycle? And what I mean by that is how long does it take you from the day you get a lead until you have a contract or you throw that lead out? And, and how, how, how does that happen? Well, first you've got to make contact. There are seven stages. First, you've got to make contact. Who, how do you make contact? You got to prospect, you got to find somebody, you got to make contact. Then you have to qualify. So, you know, prospecting is, uh, you know, calling on, finding, finding those leads. Um, you know, I call it dumpster diving. When I see a roll off dumpster, it might be too late. They've already pulled a building permit, but you got to figure out who am I prospecting to? And once you decide who that is and where you're going, then you got to make contact. Is by phone? Is that by email? Is that knocking on the door? How do you make contact? And once you do that, I got to qualify that prospect. Is he really, what's he need? Does he need video? Does he need a commercial fire alarm? Um, just intrusion, just a hold up button. What, what does that prospect need? And is he, and I have to qualify them. Do they have a need? Most do. And I need to qualify, will they be able to buy something from me? Do they have the funds? Do they have the budget? Do they have the interest? And then you got to nurture that prospect. It could, it could, commercially, it could take three, four, five visits till you get warm enough that that prospect says, you know what, we really could use a video surveillance system for our back parking lot. We just fenced it in and we have an electric gate. And so now you've got a prospect that you've qualified. They need something. Um, now it's time to present your offer. And how are you going to present that? Who are you presenting it to? We'll talk about that later. And then, of course, you got to overcome objections. I can't afford it. I, uh, I don't need it. Uh, we're not spending any money right now. We're selling our building next week. What, whatever the objection is, you need to overcome the reasonable objections and move to a sale. And then the most important, you got to close it. How long does it take you to do that? You need to go back and say to yourself, um, hey, what was, go back to the last sale you had. Yesterday, Monday, when did you first get that lead? If you sold something and brought a contract in on Monday, 
When did you, did you get that lead six months ago? Did you get it six hours ago? Did it come in Friday afternoon? What's your sales cycle? And, and once you determine your sales cycle, how long, I, I know that my sales cycle is about five weeks. It's about five weeks. And I know that my average sales is about $30,000. And it takes me about five weeks from when I find out about something until I'm turning a contract in. You need to know what your cycle is because you need to manage that cycle. Um, and if you have lots of, uh, of leads and no closes, uh, then you've got some other problems and we'll talk about that in the sales cycle. Lead flow, distribution. These are very important things. Um, what's your distribution policy? Do you have a distribution policy? You should have one. Um, this is an office with three salespeople. Fred gets the residential, Harry gets the commercial, and I get the financial, the banks. Or I get every other lead or every third lead. You have to have a distribution policy and don't cheat. If you do, you will lose a good salesperson. You can't sit there and say, oh, Fred's up next. We just got a call in from a school district that wants to do 10 schools. Fred can't do that. He doesn't know how to lay that out. Go help Fred close that. If you take that and go, I'm going to take that lead, we'll give Fred the next one, you're going to lose good salespeople. Put your distribution plan of your leads in writing, and all of your salespeople should know that, and certainly admin, as they get the calls or the web leads or, or whatever. You need to track your leads. You can't just write it on a little sheet of paper and say, hey, this guy's building a new building. Uh, go out and see him. Track that lead. So, so if you're a sales manager and you're sitting down with your salespeople, you should be able to open up the book, today it's a tablet, and say, I gave you nine leads last month. Tell me about that. Who'd you see? Who didn't you see? Who, 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 who should you go see? Um, I want to know about this. And I want to track it. And we use a very simple one, two, three method. One. I had a first appointment. I got in front of that customer, uh, that prospect. Number two, I have a second appointment. I got out, I saw them, they didn't throw me out. They said, come back next Tuesday. And number three, in my heart, I believe it's 90% or better, I'm going to sell them something. I might not sell them the whole ball of wax. I might only sell them three cameras for the lobby, but I'm going to sell that prospect something, and I give that a three, and that's a 90% chance, and then there's a dollar amount inside. Now, as a sales manager or a salesman, you can look at all your ones and twos and threes. If you've got a guy that's got a lot of ones, I got a lot of ones, I saw a lot of people, but he doesn't have any twos, he's got a problem getting in the sales cycle. He's having a problem nurturing that customer and getting that customer to say, Come back, I want to see you again. I want to talk to you about that access control system. I want to talk to you about sprinkler monitoring, outside video surveillance. If he has a lot of ones and a lot of twos and no threes, he's got a problem handling objections. He can't get anything to the end. I had a great sales guy named Ed, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He used to show me the box I've got so many leads I can't follow them. It could close or nothing. He could prospect and find all kinds of leads. He just couldn't close. He couldn't get them over the finish line. So how many ones, how many twos, how many threes? Very simple. And then you need to measure those results. What percentage? We talked about the sales cycle. How many ones, twos, and threes? What percentage did you close? So if he had 10 ones last month, and he closed two of them proportionally as the number of leads, he closed 20% of his leads. He's got a 20% closing ratio. But from a financial standpoint, he may have 10 leads, and one of the two that he closed is a $100,000 job that blows him way out of his quota and everything else. So you have to measure those results, and then what are your measurement requirements? What's the quota? What's the quota for RMR? What, what, is, what is the minimum uh, volume uh, that he's got to bring in? 
um, you know, what what keeps him employed? What keeps him employed? So now you understand the lead flow and a little bit of a little bit of uh, how to measure that. How many prospecting calls did you make last week? Sit in your head right now, pull your calendar up, and go back and say, well, I called on that architect. I stopped in a church under construction. I sent three emails out to electricians. I put a bid out to a city. How many prospecting calls did you make? How many doors did you knock on? And today, it's not a lot of door knocking. It's emailing. It's phone calling. It's prospecting. How many realtors did you talk to? How many, how many calls did you make? Because that's going to dictate how many ones and twos and threes you have 30 days, 40 days from now. If you didn't do much prospecting last week and you have already determined, like I have, that my sales cycle is five weeks, if I didn't do crap last week, you can be assured five weeks from now, there's going to be a day. It's, it's not rocket science. So you got to continue to fill that funnel. I prospect every day. I read all the area newspapers, I cook things out, I scan it, I send it out to the salespeople. I, 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 we have lots of ways to find business. You got to go get it. You don't get anything. It's like dating. You get nothing if you don't ask for it. Um, prospect. Choose your prospects wisely. You only have so many hours in a day. Choose them. Be choosy. Which ones are going to generate the most business for you? You may just be a commercial fire guy. Yeah. Whatever. So you're not really going to be calling on anybody but architects and engineers and electricians and contractors that are building buildings. You're a commercial fire guy. You're going to be calling on all the hotels that are 10 years or older or 20 years or older, because it's time for them to upgrade and replace their firearms. It depends on what you're selling, but you need to be choosing. You can't call on everyone. It's a waste of time. Focus. I call on architects on Monday. I call on electricians on Tuesday. I call on builders, or I, I work this geographic area on Mondays. I work this geographic area on Wednesday. I'm in the office Friday mornings, whatever. Identify who's most likely to buy. If you have success calling on churches, then you should be calling on every church in the world. You should be calling on every pastor, every the churches who sit there empty 95% of the time. They do catch fire and they do get broke into. So if your thing is churches, call on all of them. Profile what kind of client you're most comfortable. Some people, I'm not comfortable with residential. I mean, I, I'm not comfortable with anybody. But if, you, if you're a salesperson, I really don't want to go to anybody's house. That's not really my thing. I really only want to call them car dealerships and commercial accounts and outdoor surveillance and scrapyards or whatever. Profile, identify what kind of customers have I been selling that I've had success at, I'm really good at, and how did I get them? Oh, I got those last three big ones because I knew this guy because he was friends with an architect or my banker or whatever. You need to, you need to, to profile that sale, past sales, and turn that into what I should be doing, who I should be calling on, where were my past successes. And if you don't have past successes, you don't have any past successes, you got to work with another salesperson in the company that has had past success, uh, successes. You got to build your profile. What your hey, my average client is twenty eight hundred dollars, and it's it's twenty five hundred square foot less uh, business. You know, it's a pizza shop, it's a nail salon. So what? Okay, if that's your thing, and if you're territory based, then you should go to every one of them all the time. There shouldn't be a barber shop, a nail salon, a pizza store, a little restaurant, anybody with a liquor license, whatever. You should know if you don't own that territory, somebody else. Target businesses that have the highest likelihood of success and forget the rest. What, you know, bars and restaurants. I mean, this is COVID. I know restaurants are going out of business. But the ones that have stayed in business are successful. They're adding more cameras. 
They're demonstrating that they're maintaining the six foot rule. They're demonstrating, they can demonstrate in, the, in recording that people are wearing their masks and so on and so forth. Target those customers that are likely to buy. And the social unrest and stores getting broken into, and who knows what's going on with the selection. Uh, you know, when the economy is great, the security industry grows. Building construction is up. If the economy tanks, probably we'll win a little recession, crime goes up. And when crime goes up, we get busy. There's no excuse to not be prospecting and not be closing business. You just need to target the right businesses. Who's most likely to buy? Another thing, prospecting. You have to be prepared. You can't just willy-nilly pull in. I willy-nilly pull in because I'm a very, very, very good prospector. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody about anything. I walk in there with a hat, hard hat in a building under construction like I'm the freaking city inspector. And I get the, I take pictures of the drawings, the name, and who's building it. No problem. But you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. You have to have safety goggles. You have to have a helmet in your in a plain white helmet. You don't need to put your logo on. You're sneaking into a building. You might need it when you're doing a walkthrough, but you need to be prepared. You also, who's in charge? What do they do here? Like, like uh, we were just bidding on uh, Fulton Opera House in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's the oldest continuously operating opera house in the United States. And they were going, they were going through a big uh, campaign, big renovation. And we were trying to get in there. And of course, we did get in and we did sell them about $225,000 upgrade of their fire alarm and so on and so forth. But I had to go to the board and find out who was on the board because we couldn't get by the general contractor. We couldn't get by the gatekeeper. So I said, who's on the board that I know? And there's 10, 12 people on the board, three or four of them were our customers, residential customers, business customers. One guy was a banker. They all knew who we were. We got in, we got the deal. So you can't just prospect knock on the door and go, well, what do they do here? You should at least know, hey, I'm knocking on the door of a company called Opsec. It's right here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. What in the world is Opsec? You can Google it while you're sitting there on this seminar. Opsec does the hologram uh, uh, tickets for all the NBA and NFL games. They do the security ticket. Do they need security? Yeah. Are they a big customer? Yes, they are now. So you got to know what they do. So who are you prospecting to? You, you profile them, but you know who's are you talking to the maintenance guy or the president? What do they do? Who's on the board? Corporate decision makers expect you to have an understanding of their business and kind of be up to date. You know, like uh, you're calling on scrapyards and and metals. Uh, you know, uh, precious metals are up, copper and. And, and, and those kind of things. They would expect you to understand why you're not going to the door to sell them cameras. You have to be reflective. You've got to analyze the variables that influence your success. I like the train thing to stop looking and listen. As a matter of fact, if you come into our Lancaster headquarters, I have an old train sign in there. It says, stop, look, and listen. So sometimes we, me, talk too much. And sometimes we just need to listen. But what are the variables that, that influence your success? What are you really good at? Are you good at making a presentation? Are you really good at prospecting, but, you're, but you don't really know how to operate a PowerPoint? You can't really put the proposal together? Um, you know, what, where have you had success and what, is in, what influences that? Evaluate if you've targeted the right companies and the right decision makers. And you need to look and listen what you're saying in your voice. You should be doing a presentation to your spouse or significant other and playing it back. I mean, you got a cell phone, record yourself and look at your emails. When I get an email, marketing email, if there's a misspelling in it, I delete it. If you can't spell check, then don't send me anything. So you should make sure what you're sending out looks right, feels right, smells right, it's written correctly. Study your approach to prospect. Again, cannot be willy-nilly pulling in the parking lot and ramrodding in the front door and say, is the president here? That's not 
prospecting. That's just door knocking. That will get you some, but not what you can accomplish if you learn to use some of these skills in prospecting and you study your approach and get better at your approach. Referrals. Growing your business is hard work. We all know it. Our job is to help you grow your business. The sales group, I call it the sales group. It could be salespeople, customer service reps, inside sales, whatever floats your boat. The sales group function is a time consuming job with the ever moving target of filling your sales funnel with fresh prospects. I have said for the 50, whatever it is, years I've been in this business, I have never come in to work and someone was lined up at the front door saying, hey, I'd like to buy an alarm. I need a video system. Never had anybody at the front door. You got to go find it. You got to fill that sales funnel. And by prospecting and finding business and getting referrals from happy customers, the best qualified leads come from a strong referral business. You should have realtors and electricians and architects in your funnel. They should be in your funnel giving you referral. Hey, this guy's breaking ground. Hey, this guy just leased 10,000 square feet. Get, get that. You got to constantly fill your funnel with fresh prospects. If you don't do that, your one, two, three is just going to fall out. You're not going to have prospects that convert, that convert to ones, that become twos, that become closer. Always be filling your funnel, whether you're on the golf course, sitting at the diner, everybody is a potential prospect, everybody. Set a target. Go back, go back and say, how many referrals did I get in October of this year? I got three, okay? Well, I really want to get, and what happened to this three? I sold all three. Well, if you got three referrals and you sold all three, then I want six referrals, and I want to sell all six. What did I do to get those three? And what do I got to do to get six? So you say, I want to double my referrals. I want to go 100%. And I want to do that in a period of 30 days or 60 days. Um, do what I used to do with my goal. I would take red lipstick and put it on the mirror in my bedroom. My goal is $10,000 this month. I look at it every morning. What percentage of increase of referrals would you like in what period of time? If you're getting a ton of referrals now and you're not closing, you have another problem. If you're not getting a lot of referrals and you're not working your network, you know, how many contacts do you have in your phone? I have 6,000. Are you saving every email address? Are you telling them what you do, how you do, when you have success? Do you email your architect saying, just completed a commercial fire alarm system at the Hilton Inn? Blah, 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 blah. Are you telling people what you're doing? And of course, social media will talk about it. But set a target to increase your referrals. You probably need more. And, and manage it. And you know, follow it. See, did I get six more? How did I get the, the three I got in, in October? Well, I got them because I picked up the phone because these guys knew me. Well, OK, I need more. I, want, I need more. How, how did, how, I got to get more architects, more electricians, more builders. How do I get more referrals? Referrals. The timing of getting a referral on a sale is after the close? No. I say let the customer experience your good work first before asking for referrals. A lot of people say, well, once you get the contract signed, you say, uh, Mr. Drucker, do you have anybody else that might need a video system? I don't do that. I wait until we do a wonderful installation. I always start the job and I always end the job. And then I let them use the system for a week or so. And then I call them back. Is everything working good? How about some referrals? And you know, and you, then your pitch is I can't help Mrs. Smith to see how happy you are with this video surveillance system for your car dealership. Is there anyone in your network that you would feel comfortable with referring? Uh, referring me, I'd like to you know, see if uh, I could uh, help some other folks uh, secure their parking lots as well. Always ask after they've experienced your good work. If you're not doing good work, then you need to change companies. You gotta do good work. You gotta install it right. You gotta show up on time. You gotta, you gotta 
get it working, when you make the customer happy, brand it with your company name, and then ask them for a referral. Um, find the happiest customers in your database, those that are at static. Kevin's Produce is a big produce company here. They got 200 trucks and they sell a wholesale produce distributor up and down the East Coast. Kenny Myers, who owns Kegels, loves me. Gives me all his business. Gives me his employees, gives referrals, loves us. He's in, he's in our top 10, 15, and 20. They're ecstatic about our service. Ask them for referrals. Find your top 10 or 15. Right now, you should be saying, my top 10 customers are, boom, 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 boom. I'd be on the phone with them after this seminar and say, is everything working okay? Pop, pop, pop. And hey, how about, uh, do you have anybody else that you can recommend that we uh, benefit from using one of my services? Ask them for referrals. Get your top 10 or 15 in the mood and in the groove of giving you referrals on a regular basis. Give and receive. So you give your customers extra service and follow up before asking for referrals. When you give willingly to your customers, they'll return the favor. So we use, um, we feed the hand of feeds. And one of the things we use as a referral is a gift card, not a MasterCard or American Express, a gift card to one of our customer restaurants. We do this in all of our branches. So when a realtor gives me a referral, he doesn't really want me to send him 50 bucks or a month's free monitoring. I mail him a card with Lombardo's restaurant on it. Thank you card, thanks for referral, sold the system to Bill Smith, please enjoy dinner on me. And then the restaurant sees that we're buying at a discount, we're buying cards from them and giving them out, we're bringing people into their restaurant. And you constantly will get referrals when you give willingly to your customer, they will they'll return the favor. You give willingly to your referrals, they'll return the favor. Inform your customers what type of customers you can help. I kind of like this, I like this one because the um, a lot, I, I have, have had customers, as good as we think we are, I've had customers buy a video alarm system from some guy that just sells ABs and video, and the customer say, well, I didn't know you did that. You know, how embarrassing. And I've got the Bergen fire system in, a, in an office building, and I come by and they've got a competitor's video system because they didn't know we did that. Whose fault is that? Mine. I didn't, I didn't tell them what we did. I didn't email them enough. I didn't say we've got the latest in analytical video, IP talk down, managed access, managed video. I didn't tell them what we do. They think we're brother alarm company. Those days are long gone. What you got to tell your customer what type of customer you can help. And to do that, you have to tell them all the services and all the stuff you can provide to them. 24 hour monitoring, uh, managed access control. People don't want to manage their access control. Um, you have to provide to your customer a clear, or your referral person, a clear picture of the customer demographics that will help your referral market. So when you're talking to an architect, he needs to know what you can do. So when he gets a contract to Put a million dollar addition on a church, he goes, oh, I gotta give select like security call. I got let's bring them in here. Even though, even though you know ABC alarm is is currently there, I'm gonna get a referral and get in. And I can tell you, if I get in, I'm gonna get the deal. And you need to think that way, you need to sell that way. If I get any one of you dealers into Las Vegas or our corporate headquarters here, you're gonna become a dealer. You will. You'll see the investment that we made in people, technology, and facilities. That's all we have to sell as a service. That's all you have to sell. So tell your referrals 
what you can do for other customers and let them know constantly updating what you are doing and how you're helping other people. And that will help them think about the demographics uh, of, of, of the perfect customer for you, whatever your demographics are. Offer reward. Uh, you need to create a reward program for your refer. It's, it's all different. Service discount, monitoring credit, prepaid gift cards, store restaurant we talked about. You need to put that referral program together so your salespeople know what they can offer and what's meaningful. What is a meaningful, meaningful reward? Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'll tell you there's a guy named Andy, last name will go on name, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm sure if I had all your pictures up on the screen and I, I asked you to put your hand up, who gets referrals from a realtor? You're all going to say, I get a bag of one or two a month. Well, we get 40 a day from Andy in Lancaster. Because he goes under the MLS report and emails me every closing that happened yesterday. So in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, there might have been 140, 150 transfers of residential properties yesterday. We sort them very quickly by price and value. They're not under contract with anybody. They're not aware yard signs out there. It's a new homeowner. We sort by the, the, uh, by the uh, value of the transaction. We load in a little fast little software program off the internet tells us least routing. We never get to all of them. And our number one residential salesperson goes to the top value houses, knocks on the door and welcomes them to the neighborhood. What does Andy get? He never pays a dime for service or monitoring. He's got a wonderful uh, interactive uh, automation system in, in his house uh, here in downtown Lancaster and he'll never pay a dime. And he remembers he never pays a dime because every day it's public record. He cuts and pastes and ships us what closed yesterday. Fastest way we're going to get a list of the houses. So what works for Andy is, Andy loves doing it for us and never pays, and he talks about select all the time. And we have, we have more residential customers in Lancaster County than anybody else. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. You cannot say it enough. I personalize, we have little cards, thank you cards. Personalize your voicemail. Not, 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 hey, thanks a lot for your business. Not pre recorded. <clears throat> hey, Bill, this is Pat Egan. I hope I understand the installation went great. Uh, hope everything's all right. I, I know you were a little concerned about downloading it on your wife's phone and wanted to make sure that, you know, Mary Kay's phone is working. Mary Kay, I remember the wife's name, that her phone's working. And just call me back if you need any additional help. And thanks a lot. And uh, uh, I'll talk to you in a week or so. And then I follow up a week later. Thanks again, ask for referral, put a couple business cards in there. Goes a long way. Give feedback on your success. No obligation to call back. You're no obligation for that customer to call back and give me a referral. But he just got a thank you note. He just got a thank you voicemail left on his office phone. A personalized handwritten note. Hey, thanks a lot for the business. It's not old fashioned, it works. Network in high places. Um, I network at the diner, Linden Diner, every morning. Anybody want to ever sit with me for an hour? I'll be at the Linden Diner in Manheim Pike in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, every morning when I'm not traveling. Why am I there? Because everybody knows me. And I, it's not egotistical, and I'm talking to everybody. And I'm walking out of there with leads. Disregard the dead ends and chase, chase the hot ones. The police, the police eat there in the mornings. They know who I am. I also know they just worked all night long and probably had a burglar or two. I'm going to find out about that before it's in the paper. That's how you do it. Network with everyone. And I call it networking in high places. Who is most likely to give you a lead and to help, you know, to help you succeed in your business.
talking to strangers, three foot rule. On a bus, on a train, on a plane. I love to tell the plane ride. I am sitting next to a lovely lady flying somewhere, and we got into a conversation, and she's in the medical marijuana business. We've done half a million dollars with that company today. In a facility in Ohio, a facility in um, Oklahoma, and their facility in uh, Pennsylvania, and they're about to break ground on another one. And I would have never, ever found out about that company and got past the gatekeeper unless I turned to this lady next to me and said, Hi, what do you do? And she told me what she did, and I told her what I did. So I try to pick my neighbor. I fly southwest a lot. I try to pick who I'm going to sit next to, and it's not the little old lady knitting. It's somebody that's got his laptop out because I want to get a lead. And my wife complains that I do pick up a little bit. If I'm in the south, I start saying, y'all, uh, but you've got to copy their tone and their speed and their volume, and it builds a warm conversation. People like people who are like them. Make that person feel the most interesting person you've ever met. I hate to fish. I hate golf. Ball's too small, stick's too long. But if I walk in your office and you've got pictures of golfers or a big fish on the wall, I'm going to talk about that. I don't know what that fish is, but I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to make him feel warm. I'm going to make him feel interested, that I'm interested in him. And I'm going to move that lead generation to a prospect, to a sale. Prospecting by phone. You got a lot of windshield time out there. You need to schedule. I like to schedule two hours a day for making calls. I'm going to make calls between 10 and noon. And you tell your office, you tell your wife, hey, don't bother me between 10 and noon. I'm going to call these 11 people. I'm going to follow up with these things. I'm prospecting. I'm calling these five architects the first uh, Tuesday of every month. And you have to treat those phone prospects with the same respect as your face-to-face. -face. Are you going to get hung up on one? Yep. And if you've got a problem handling rejection, get out of the sales field. You need to handle rejection, flush it down the toilet, and move on. And go for the next prospect. Someone's going to buy something from you. When was the last time you called all the architects in your market area and let them know what you do? When was the last time you called on every motorcycle shop? When was the last time you talked to every crime prevention officer or the fire marshals? When did, did you get all the fire marshals together? And, 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 I mean, it's COVID time, I get it. But when did you bring them all together and do a, a pizza luncheon and talk about the latest, greatest, what you always want to know about firearms but we're afraid to ask? Get in front of your people. Get on the phone and get in front of your prospects. Call between appointments. That's dead time. You don't need to be listening to the radio. You need to be focusing on getting a few more appointments. Particularly if you are driving a long distance to a particular appointment, you should be prospecting on the way out and prospecting on the way back. I like to talk about the two Ps. I want you to do the two Ps Prospect and present six hours a day. Nine to noon and one to four are the best times. That's when you should be finding business or presenting business. Okay, all this other crap of searching the internet and finding out who build them up, do that before and after. Prime time, nine to noon, one to four. Prospecting and presenting. Get out there and find it, get out there and present it. So we talked about prospecting. Um, the right people. Professional, I just I jumped ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Professionals accept rejection. Don't take rejection personally. It is to be anticipated when you're qualifying your prospect and use that as a feedback tool. All right. Use use I got rejected. Why did I lose that deal? Did I present it wrong? Did my pricing wrong? Did I some wrong parts? Did I show up late? Did I look sloppy? What why did you get rejected? Sales rep would take rejection personally, lack 
perseverance and rarely make the sale. That's why I said, if you can't handle rejection, you need to get out of this field. What, talk about building a sales plan. Talk about building a prospecting plan. How many phone calls? How many cold calls? How many referrals? How many trade shows? How many direct mail or direct email? How about beginning lost accounts? Existing customers? Are you doing customer service? This is where I normally, if we were in a room, we would do, a, do an exercise here. So when you build your prospecting plan, tell me what it's going to be. If we're going to do nine to noon and one to four, uh, is nine to noon phone calls, and, and I'm working industrial parts, and one to four, I'm making presentations to, to builders, to contractors, whatever. Um, you know, I'm going to go to three trade shows. I'm going to do five direct email blasts this month. Build that plan and then stick to it. Whatever, whatever you decide that plan is, build it and stick to it. Don't forget about existing customers. I remember one of the old sales skills, diamonds in your own backyard. You don't, I tell my salespeople, you don't have to get in a car and drive to Allentown, Pennsylvania, two hour, hour and a half away. There's stuff right around the corner. Diamonds in your own backyard. Know your territory. If you don't own, somebody else will. You better know your territory. And you better not let me in it because I'll take, I'll take the business. Assume the RMR. I can't tell you how many companies I visit and, and I ask them for a copy of their proposal. And they have this lovely proposal and all these technical bulletins and nine cameras and this and that and everything. It's $10,212. Okay? That's it. I said, well, where's the recurring revenue? Across the street is select security. Nothing. Nothing gets sold without an RMR contract. A five-year commercial, three-year residential, auto renewal contract. I don't care if it's a maintenance contract, annual inspection, testing, cleaning, cleans, you know, you sell a camera system, $10,000 camera system, it comes with a service contract and an annual cleaning and adjusting all the cameras. It's not an option. Oh, your warranty expires and your extended warranty begins day 91 at $31.72 a month. It's not an option. It is on the proposal as a requirement. However you want to do it, Parts only, labor only, standard premium 24-7, standard Monday through Friday, test and inspect. You know, we do an annual inspection for residential clients. I don't care if it's a 10,000 square foot house or a 1,500 square foot house. It's $96 a year. But it's not $96 a year. It's $8. It's $8 a month. Bill along with their monitoring. And once a year, we go out and straighten up the yard sign, clean the stickers off, Check the battery, find out they added an addition and they should add another door contact, upgrade, sell them something. It gets us in front of the customer so they don't forget who we are. And we incentivize our technicians to pick up referrals when they're there. Sales plan. Never bad mouth your customers. This comes from my mother. I'm also looking at the clock and making sure that I'm on time. My mother said to me a long time ago, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. So we have an arch rival competitor. This person hates me. Just, and he bad mouth, and we get so much business because he bad mouth. He is a fabulous golfer. So when anybody says to me, hey, what do you think about so-and-so? My answer is, he is a great golfer. I'm a better security guy. He's a fabulous golfer. Say something nice. Don't say anything bad about your competitors. Yes, you got competitors that are better than you, that are worse than you. Move on. You're selling your company. Build your brand. Be confident in your brand and your people and show it. Always talk nice. I said we were going to talk about lead flow prospecting, referrals, lead generation, and sales plan. And I believe that we've covered it all. 
So here's the sales pitch. That's me. That's how you find me. That's Kirk. That's how you find Kirk. And then we've got some regional folks that cover the country. Uh, that's a little picture of our monitoring center. So Kirk runs the Midwest. Jennifer Solston is our West Coast development rep. Jennifer lives in Seattle. Carl lives in Dallas and handles the Southwest region. And Paul lives in Atlanta. And Kirk's in charge of all of them. And we have a lovely lady, Melissa. It does inside sales and setting appointments for our salespeople. I invite any of you to come to Lancaster or to uh, Las Vegas and see either one of our primary central stations or visit us in San Antonio. Um, I'm now open for questions and we have about seven minutes left.